We're back with your questions for Grover Norquist, the creator of the Taxpayer Protection Pledge, and Steve Malanga of the Manhattan Institute, a specialist on governments and how they squander tax money. So first, from my Facebook page, uh, Eric Treasure asks, what's so horrible about default? Why shouldn't government creditors who choose to invest in the fleecing of their fellow man pay the consequences? <laughs> well, give them a haircut. <laughs> give them a haircut. Well, one of the problems is, is it, it creates complications down the road because if you have both foreign governments and also pension funds and so forth who are investing in treasury certificates, you're asking them to take a haircut. Next time around, they might be not be so willing. And so a government that is going to, over time, reduce its debt but is going to have to rely on debt for some time before it does that. If you stiff creditors, you do risk the fact that they won't come to the well anymore. Well, it's more than risk, right? I mean, they won't come to the well at the same price. At, at the and same, they might they definitely won't at, at the same yeah. price. So it'll get more expensive. But the, the real risk is that some people will step out of the market almost completely and then you can't finance all this debt that unfortunately we have. Stephanie Clark Mons asks, I understand the debt crisis has been raised before many, many times. Why does it all seem to be coming to a head this time? What's different? Well, in past times when they have raised it, they've had some uh, restraint on spending or some uh, reform that they wanted to attach to it. So it's not unreasonable to ask for reform attached to debt ceiling increase. But the size of this debt ceiling increase is larger than we've seen before. The rapidity, this, this is coming so soon because spending increase has been so dramatic over the last three years. That's what's shocking to the system. And some history on that. It used to be that Congress had to approve every treasury bond and they said, oh, well, now we're borrowing so much we can't do that. They started setting these limits. Uh, pundits and politicians say it'll be a disaster if Congress doesn't vote to raise the debt ceiling. Here's the president. We would risk sparking a deep economic crisis. Why is he so certain? People forget that a similar crisis happened in 1995. You remember that one? President Clinton and the Republican Congress couldn't agree on a budget, so government shut down twice, the second time for three weeks. Almost a million government workers were told, don't come to work. So did the economy grind to a halt? No. Do you even notice that the Labor Department or Commerce Department wasn't busy doing the mostly useless stuff they do? I doubt it. This chart shows what happened to the stock market. The shutdowns are the shaded parts. During the first shutdown on your left, the stock market went up. During the second, it dropped, but then recovered. And today, despite all the screaming, we must raise the ceiling or no one will loan us money. They sure are loaning us money now. This week, people bought 10-year treasury bonds, and the government only had to promise to pay them back in 10 years, a promise, plus a measly 3.3% interest. People trust that they'll get paid back, I guess. In 1981, they had to pay 15% interest. So are the investors all stupid? I mean, it's possible, but I doubt it. They're betting their own money, and I think they're smarter than the politicians. Uh, I, I, that, that they know that the two trillion dollars in tax dollars are coming in, they'll probably get paid or maybe take a small haircut. Not raising the debt ceiling is no crisis. I worry more about what will happen if Congress just keeps spending the way it has. But Grover, you have said it is important for them to raise this ceiling. My concern is that you hand over to the president complete control of what bills to pay and what bills not to pay. I'm not sure I like that power in the executive branch. I would like to see us not raise taxes and cut as much spending as possible while increasing the debt ceiling somewhat. But I'd keep the president on a short lease, do it for five, six months, come back and demand more spending cuts. But what do you mean? If we don't raise the ceiling, I don't see how that gives these powers to the president. Because then the president gets to decide what bills to pay and what bills not to pay. He doesn't have as much money as he needs to pay them all. He'll decide. Something tells me Acorn still gets paid. Something tells me all of the things that you or I would look at as the completely irrelevant parts of government, they'd get paid first. But he'd only have two-thirds the money, so he'd have to cut. That's true. And he, and he would blame everybody but himself. Gotcha. Okay, another question from Facebook. Scott Violet asks, why is no one producing a plan that has any immediate cuts? We need to cut spending next year, not over 10 years. 
Well, I'm, one of the reasons is because there is a constituency for every one of these programs, and essentially, you are going to upset someone if you cut. That is just one of the problems with spending, that as you spend, as you buy into programs, you create constituencies, and the constituencies will scream, and nobody wants to take that political heat. That's why it becomes so hard to cut government. And some of them are so awful. In today's paper, there's the story about the es essential air service to these little airports where wealthier people like me vacation and you get cheap flights to keep the airport open. The government pays more for the ticket than you do and they can't get rid of it, even in this time of so-called crisis. They're not trying. They're not trying to cut spending because the president is still trying to talk us into tax increases to continue the spending. Once we've convinced them we're not raising taxes, then we focus on spending. Only then do we focus on spending. And we have to have bifocal vision. We've got to focus on the stupid stuff now. But the big savings come from making small changes now that over the next 30 years make significant savings in the entitlement programs. And, and you are, always have been an optimist about this stuff. Well, I, I'm a pessimist. I'm a long-term optimist. <laughs> Steve, I'll give you the last word. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess I would say that I am a long-term optimist because I believe that one of the ways out of this is by restraining spending to get the economy going again because eventually we will grow our way out of this and not spend our way out of this. I hope we you're hope. right. We <laughs> certainly need growth to do it. Well, thank you, Steve Malanga, Grover Norquist. Thank you. Coming up, I'll show you that I can cut the budget so there's no debt crisis. It can be done. <laughs>